Spirit that enables and empowers us to walk with God on a daily basis faithfully and to see the fruit of walking with the Lord um, in our lives. And so we just want to give them that gift of, of experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit for themselves. So um, yeah, we'll be gone about three weeks and we are uh, more than halfway through our uh, goal of our financial goal. We're raising about $6,000 and it's covering our kids flights um, plus some other minis ground ministry expenses that we have. Um, so if you want to partner with us um, and have any questions, we're always available to talk and um, anything else. We covet your prayers, of course, as well. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's beautiful. Amen. Amen. Now, one more thing. I, tomorrow, Pastor, I'm not going to call him a pastor, but Joe Carrillo and I are headed to El Salvador tomorrow. We'll be there for through Saturday. Through Saturday. I'll be there, I believe, Monday, come back. I'll be back next Sunday. Amen. So it'll be an introductory trip. We'll be meeting pastors, doing a couple of meetings, and just see where what happens from there. Praise the Lord. Amen? Okay, you can pray for us. Praise the Lord. We'll have you pray for us at the end of this service. But if you have your Bibles, let's turn in our Bibles to Romans, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Hallelujah. And I want to begin reading with verse 1 and continue through uh, several verses here. About, about not last week, the week before that, I, uh, I was seeking the Lord. And this, the, these passages from Romans chapter, chapter 8 are, were on my mind. It's, it's, a, it's a chapter that I've preached out of before, obviously things there that that I, I've already already knew and then the Holy Spirit began dealing with me about some other other insights that are found here in this chapter uh, I went to bed that night somewhere during the middle of the night I began I began having this dream and I'm dreaming about the, these verses and the Holy Spirit is teaching me he's talking to me I can't see him, but I can hear him. I'm in, in this dream. I'm see, I, as he's telling me different things about these verses, he, I'm not only hearing what he's telling me, I'm seeing what he's saying. That's, that's, that's the, you, you have to understand that. I've only had an experience like that. This is the second time where, where he's teaching me out of Scripture. I wake up out of the dream, and this is still going on. These thoughts are still, still flooding, flooding me. And so I, I quickly wrote down, as best as I could, a lot of what was said to me. And so some of what I'm going to share with you for the next few minutes is going to, is going to come out of that. Some of the insight that I, I, I received from the Lord out, out of these verses. And I think it's important that, that we, we, uh, we understand what, what the scripture is talking about so that we can not only, we can apply it, we can live it. He's talking about living in and by the Holy Spirit in our life. But let's, let's begin with verse 1. He says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Right? For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his... God did by sending his own son in the likeness of the flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness requirement of the law, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but after, according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but they who live according to the spirit set their things on the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Uh, because the carnal mind is enmity, enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Um, for, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. The emphasis here is the Spirit of God, what? The Spirit of God dwelling in you, living in you, abiding in you. Jesus clearly told us in, 
in the book of John, uh, chapter 14, verse 16, he said, I'm going to pray the Father and give you another comforter and he will abide. He will remain in you forever. So the Holy Spirit does not go and come. He doesn't go and come. He, he's not, he doesn't vacillate. Once you receive him, he, he stays there. Amen. He's, he's a person. He's not a feeling. So you may not always feel him, but because he's a person, he's always there. And since he's always there, you can always recognize him. You can always acknowledge him. Amen. And you can, and you can fellowship with him. So let's, let's, let me read on here. You're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And if, and if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also quicken or give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So the work that God's going to do in your life, the miracles that God's going to do in your life is not going to be by, let's say it like this, by God who is in heaven. Amen. He's going to do them by God who is the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. So the miracle doesn't come from up there, it comes from out here. Right? So if you're looking up there, then you've got your eyes in the wrong place. Amen. How many remembers in the Bible, Daniel, Daniel, in order to get his prayer answered, had to know where God lived. So what did he do? He opened up his windows and he, he faced Jerusalem. He faced Jerusalem because that's where the temple was and that's where the Holy of Holies was and that's where the glory was. So he, he knew where God dwelt. So he got his prayers answered by what? By facing Jerusalem because he knew where God lived. Right? Well, God doesn't live in a place like that anymore. God lives where now? He lives in us. So, I, so in order to get my prayers answered, I got to know where God lives. Right? I got to know where God lives. So where does God live? He lives in me. He lives in you. So if you're in the middle of a crisis, God forbid, but if you get in the middle of a crisis, in that middle of a crisis, you start looking up, you're done. Amen. I'm telling you, you're in trouble. You're in big trouble. Right? Because you're not coming from up there. You don't even know where he lives. He lives right down in here. Amen. You get in a crisis, all of a sudden you look on the inside. You look on the inside. Jesus said, John chapter 7, verse 38, he said, He that believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So there's a flow that's coming up out of your spirit. There's a flow, rivers, he said, of living water coming up out of your spirit. That's where the flow is. That's where the miracle is. That's where the breakthrough is. That's where the answer is. It's flowing from on the inside. Amen? Amen. So God is going to quicken you. God is going to give you life by how? Through his spirit. Look at the last phrase of that. Verse 11. Through his spirit who it dwells in you. Through his spirit who dwells in you. That's where the miracle comes from. Amen? Amen. So you can see that we can always start, we can always start in a very positive place because I've already got the answer on the inside. Amen. I've already got the answer on the inside because I have, I have the Holy Spirit. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, that last sentence there, it's very interesting because it sort of sums up the, 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 the end result of a lot of things he said there. And we'll talk about some of those details, but I want to point this out. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. Okay, we understand that. But if by the Spirit, by the Spirit, by the Spirit, you, you, you're going to do something. Right? You are going to put to death the deeds of the body. You're going to do that. Right? Who's going to do it? You're going to do it. You're going to do that, right? So it's telling us that there is, a, there, is a, there, is a, there is an authority, there is a responsibility in your own life, and you have something to do with the manifestation of the Holy Ghost in your life. I need to say that again. You personally have something to do. You have something to do with the manifestation of the Holy Ghost in your own life. 
So it's not a matter of simply sitting in a chair and waiting on God and waiting on God's timing or waiting on God's season. He said, no. He said, you, you put to death through the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of your body. You're going to do that. Amen. That tells me, that tells me that I can manifest the power of the Holy Spirit in my life by choice. That tells me that I can choose and I can, I can pull the trigger. Right? Go put that verse back up. Don't take it down. By the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body. So I'm going to use, let me use it like that. I'm going to use, I'm going to use the power of the Holy Spirit to put to death the deeds of my body, which means he's talking, he's talking about sin. He's talking about works of the flesh. So I am the one on purpose, intentionally, have the ability to manifest the power of the Holy Ghost in my own life. That's what that says right there. Now that takes that to a whole nother, nother realm. Amen. Takes it to a whole nother realm. Hallelujah. How many of you got that? Hallelujah. Well, if I have the ability to do that, I want to know how to do that. I want to understand how to do that. Amen. Hallelujah. That this, this thing of walking in the Spirit, walking by the Spirit, experiencing the Holy Spirit, I can, I can do that intentionally. I can do that on purpose. Hallelujah. Amen. And that, that move of God in my life is, is not like a, it's not like a thunderstorm. Right? That I have no idea. I have no idea when the, when the thunderhead is going to roll in. I have no idea when, when the rain is going to start. How many of you know that even the, even the best weather forecasters have a difficulty predicting a thunderstorm? Well, they can, see the, they can see the fronts coming or whatever, but they don't know really. Thunderstorms can pop up, especially in the middle of the summer when it's high humidity and it's hot. They can just pop up. They're almost unpredictable. Amen. And some people think that the move of God in their life is like a thunderstorm. They don't know when, they don't know why, and they just, they just flounder. But God wants you to know that there, there is a law that controls those things. And God himself put that law in order. And if I understand the law, I understand how to use that law, then I can have a move of God in my life every single day. Amen. I may not, and I'm not going to say I can or can't, but I may not be able to have a move of God in your life, but I can have a move of God in my life every single day. Every single day. Hallelujah. How many knows? No dry season. Amen. No dry season. Hallelujah. I've got an abiding presence of the Holy Spirit in my life, and I'm in a rainy season all the time. Glory to God. I'm in a rainy season all the time. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Well, if that's true, then I, I, want, I want to understand that, because that's what I'm after. Now, Romans chapter 8. Now, I realize my time is short, and I'm not going to keep you too, too long here, but let me point out a couple of things as we lay foundation for this because I want to talk about this for, I don't know, maybe a couple of Sundays. We'll see. All right? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are, those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay. Verse 2. I'm skipping through here. For the law, here it is, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So the moment he makes it a law, he takes, he takes, he takes, I hate to use, but I'll use this. He takes this, he takes the idea of sovereignty out of it. Right? It's a law. God, you notice something about God is that God created the world, right? God created the world. Go back and read Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2. God creates the whole world. But he set up systems that would reproduce themselves without his direct involvement. Right? How many know that God actually, actually only created one man and one woman? I know we're all created by God. We, we understand that. But we weren't created the same way Adam and Eve were. Amen? God put, you know, you know the story, put the dust together, breathed in Adam's nostrils. He became a, he became a living soul and he stood up a grown man. 
He didn't have to be taught to eat, how to eat. He didn't have to be taught how to walk. He, didn't have, he, he, was, he was brilliant. He was a genius. In the moment he was created, then God took a rib out, and with the rib he created the woman, and she was f- full grown. Right? Full grown, beautiful woman. And then, then he brings them together, and they get married. Okay? So now God has created one man, one woman. So then what does he do? How's he going to create the rest of us? <laughs> Y'all quiet. <laughs> How's he going to create the rest of us? Is he going to, is he, every time, every time he wants a new human being, is he going to, is he going to form that man out of dust and breathe in his nostrils the breath of life? No. He gave that first man and that first woman, he made a law. He made a law that said what? That he told them to be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I don't have to explain the biology. <laughs> right? Okay. So, so he made a law. He made a law. Yeah, we were created by God, but in all reality, the, the, the authority of procreation was given to our parents. And they, they, and you say, well, pastor, I was an accident. You weren't no accident. That's a lie, amen. God knew you were coming. He got ready for your coming. He knew your name before you were conceived. Come on now, hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Now what we see here, what we see here in, in Romans chapter 8 is a parallel between, between Romans 8. There's a parallel between Romans chapter 8 and Genesis chapter 3. It's an exact parallel. In Genesis chapter 2 and 3, you have two trees. Right? You got two trees. You got the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you got the tree of life. That which a man would eat thereof and never die. Right? Adam has a choice. He can eat or not eat from either tree based on his own decision. He can decide, eat of this tree or eat of that tree. Now the devil must have known that if Adam ate of the tree of life, he was finished forever. So he tried to get their attention on the other tree as much as possible. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Because the, what, was the, what was the effect of eating of the tree of life? Life. Amen. What was the effect of eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? death right for the day you eat thereof you will surely die so what you have there is the law of life and the law of sin and death those trees represent both of those laws the law of life and the law of sin and death now i just want to point that out that it, that tree the first tree was the law of life right the, tr- the fruit of life the tree of life and adam could eat of it anytime he decided he would go up there and pick a fruit any time. I don't think he ever did. As a matter of fact, I know he never did. I don't know why he didn't. Right? He should have. He should have he intentionally ate that fruit. And can you imagine? Here, here's a thought. If Adam, had, if Adam had ate that fruit first and then never ate the other fruit, do you know that you still would have been born? Did you know that? You still would have been born. But you would have been born in a totally different condition. You would have been born in a totally different position. You would have been born into a perfect world. And you know Adam and Eve and all your grandparents because they would have never died. Amen. And they all look like they were in their 30s. Hey, come on now. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the moment you were born, man, then you grow up and you know you'd never get sick, never die. Man, it would just be great. Isn't that right? Amen. So if, if Adam had never sinned, then you would have still been born. You would have still been born, but you would have come into this world in a different condition, in a different situation. We see the same thing. We see the same thing in Jesus, right? David is king. We know the story of, the, of King David and the glories of David's kingdom. And then, then Solomon, his son, and the glories of Solomon's kingdom. The kingdom of Israel at that time is the envy of the world. But it, Israel sins, and they fall from that place. So generations later, Jesus is born the son of David. Jesus is born the son of David. Being the son of David, he's heir to the throne of Israel. But because of their sin, he comes into the world in a different place, in a different condition. 
Instead of being born in the king's palace, which was what, where he would have been born if, he, if, if, at, if at David and Solomon and all those guys had, hadn't, hadn't broken the covenant with God. Right? Instead of that, instead of being born in a king's palace, he was born in a manger. Right? And grew up, and grew up a laborer as a carpenter. Right? The point of the genealogy of Matthew is that Jesus was born in the direct genealogy of the kings. Jesus would have been the king of Israel. He was the direct descendant of King David. That's why they called him the son of David. That was not just some accolade they gave him. That was the fact. He was the son of David. He would have been the king. He would have been the king of Israel. Except he was a carpenter born in a manger. Right? So what does he do? Jesus, Jesus redeems us. He goes to the cross, sheds his blood, redeems us. That word redeem means he buys us back. He buys us back, restoring us back to our original position and condition. That's what redemption is. Isn't that right? Amen. So Jesus didn't just die and shed his blood just so you can die and go to heaven. Jesus didn't die and shed his blood so you don't have to die and go to hell. He died and shed his blood to redeem you. And restore you back to God in your original place. Hallelujah. Now, we, in, 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 according to the scripture, are back in the Garden of Eden and we have a choice. You got two trees, we got two laws. If I, I can decide to live by the law of sin and death, or I can decide to live by the law of the spirit of life which is in Christ Jesus. And if I choose to live and understand of how to live by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, then my whole life is going to experience the glory of God. I'm going to experience peace, joy, healing, and deliverance, and, and God's blessing in everything that I do. Hallelujah. Now, you can believe that if you want to or not, but that's what the Bible says. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. You've got two different directions you can live in. Say, listen to me say this, saved or not saved? Born again or not born again? You got some people born again, saved with all the potential of everything God said in this word, but they're still living by the flesh. They're still living by the law of sin and death and everything withers and everything crumbles. But I'm here to tell you there's a better way of living. There's a better way of life. And that is learn how to live by the spirit of life. Hallelujah. Learn to live by the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Say amen. Amen. We, I want to learn that. Praise the Lord. I want to learn that. Amen. Praise God. Are you with me? Praise the Lord. It's in this chapter. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, Holy Spirit, came to me in a dream and was talking to me about this chapter. Oh, it just seemed like I didn't sleep all night. He's just talking to me about this, this, this chapter. And I'm hearing it and I'm seeing it. And, and again, I've preached out of this before, studied it before, meditated it before. But he helped me see things that I've never seen before. In a way I've never seen them before. Amen. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. So Romans chapter, give, give me a few more minutes here, all right? Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. If y'all came back after I offended you about Starbucks, you, you'll wait. You'll give me some time. Amen. Give me another chance. <laughs> uh, praise the Lord. I want to show you something, okay? This is important for you to see this. All right. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans 5, 12. Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Okay, stop right there. Now, how, how, did, how did sin come into the world and death through sin? And death through sin not only means death, physical death, it means spiritual death, it means poverty, it means sickness. All of that, all that junk came into the world through sin. How? How did that happen? Now the point that I want you to see there is, is that, is that the devil isn't even mentioned. Romans chapter 5 verse 12, Romans chapter 5 verse 12 is Genesis chapter 3. Adam, Eve and Adam eating from the tree, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
This is what this is. Just as through one man's sin, except Eve is not in the New Testament scripture, Eve's not there. Right? The snake is not even there. The only person, we know that Eve was there, and we know the snake was there, but the only person God talks about in the, in the New Testament is the person who was responsible. And that was Adam. Right? So in, this, in the book of Romans is the complete detailed description of redemption. And in this detailed description of redemption, the devil doesn't even make honorable mention. He's not invited in the room. He's not, even, he's, not, he, he's, not even, he's not even mentioned because he had nothing to do with it. So some people believe that, that uh, Satan, was, Satan was powerful and that he exercised his power and he took over Adam and Eve's life and look at what he did to the world. That's not true. Right? It tells me he didn't have the power to do all of that, but Adam did. Adam was the one. He had the dominion. He had the authority. He was made in the image and the likeness of God. It was Adam who sinned that opened the door to sin, disease, and pain, and demons. He did that. Satan didn't do that. Satan didn't have the combination. He couldn't unlock the door. Satan didn't have the key to the door. He could not unlock the door. There's only one man that can open that door, and that was Adam. Are you with me? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Everybody say amen. amen. All right. Now I'm walking you through something here. Now, this, now look in your Bible to John chapter 13 verse 26. John chapter 13 verse 26. Okay. Because Matthew chapter, chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, Satan comes. And Jesus and Satan have this, have this encounter. And Satan is tempting Jesus three times and probably more than that, but three recorded times. And, and, and Jesus comes out of that wilderness totally victorious, right? Jesus comes out of, that, out of that experience, King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. He beats the devil bad. Not a little bit. He beats him so bad, the devil says, I'm never doing that again. Right? Because what did he do in Matthew 4 and Luke 4? There's no, there's no account in Scripture he ever did that ever again. He never directly encountered Jesus again. But he did work through people. Okay, now, John chapter 13, verse 26. So the devil now is saying, okay, i got to take Jesus out. If I don't take him out, then he's going to take over, right? So Satan, what does he do? Does he, does he come in, you know, with strength and power? Say, I'm going to take Jesus down, you know? No. Look at what he does. Jesus answered and said, it, he... It is to whom I shall give a sop. He's talking about the communion. When I have dipped it, and when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the, after the sop, Satan entered into him. So if, 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 if the devil is going to work a plan to put Jesus on the cross, then in the mind of the devil is going to get rid of Jesus, he's got to work through a man. He can't just do it. He can't just do it. He can't just, you know, he's got horns, you know. He's got horns and a pitchfork, and he can't just walk in there and say, okay, I'm going to put this man on the cross. He can't do that. He has to find a flesh and blood man that will cooperate with him. He has to work through that man, and that man has to do that in obedience to and submission to the devil that's working on, on the inside of him. You have to see that. <laughs> Hallelujah. So in Romans chapter 5, based on Genesis chapter 3, Satan couldn't just take over the world. He couldn't just start sickness. He couldn't just start disease. He couldn't just start famine. He needed a man. He needed the man to make a decision, an act of authority. Are you with me? Amen. Now, okay, now the devil says, okay. He said, Jesus has, has whipped me and I'm done, but I still want to kill him because I will still want to take over. But he said, I can't, I can't approach him directly. I can't just put him on a cross. i got to have somebody to help me. I need a man. So he possesses, you know, he possesses Judas Iscariot, and Judas does it. Amen? All right, now think about this one. In Revelation chapter 19 and 20, now we could read the, both those old chapters, 
both those whole chapters, but I don't have time, right? Okay, Satan is at the peak of his, of his, his greatest hour, right? The, the Antichrist and the false prophet are there. He's been working for years getting it ready, you know, to take over the world, right? Now think with me now. So, so the devil's plan is to rule the world, right? Why don't he just rule the world? He can't do it. He had to have a man. He had to have a man, the Bible calls the beast, which is the Antichrist. So there has to have a man who's, you know, who, is, who, who gets lifted up in authority and all that stuff. I don't have time to talk about all that. But he has to have a man, has to have a man who yields himself to Satan. Satan, Satan somebody said he's the incarnation of Satan. Satan could not incarnate himself. He couldn't do it. But he had to find a man who would be willing to open his heart and, and, and align their purposes. Right? Are y'all still with me? He, he had to have a man. Until he found a man, which we call the Antichrist, which is a real blood and flesh man. And that man yielded himself to the devil. The devil could not just walk in and say, I'm, I'm the devil. I see my horns and my pitchfork. I just take over. I'm going to rule the world. You know, he shows up with fire shooting out of him. I'm going to rule the world. He has no power. He can't do that. He can't do it. So what's he got to do? He's got to find a person that he probably grooms. <laughs> yeah, I'll, that's probably the right word. He grooms all the way through life and prepares this man to be the Antichrist. And when that Antichrist yields himself to the devil, the devil gives that man all of his power. The man has the authority and then the devil is able to, you know, unite, you know, kingdoms of the world and, and bring to pass all of that, you know, the revised Roman Empire that, you know, triggers the, the, the tribulation, all that stuff. Right? Satan can't just rule. He can't. He can't do that. Now here's, here, listen, he cannot just come in your life and wreak havoc. He cannot do that. He cannot just come in your life and turn upside down everything. He can't do it. People blame him for everything. But no, there are laws in place. There are laws in place. And his greatest, his, his only power is the power of what? Is the power of seduction. Is the power of temptation. Right? If he can get you, if he can get you to start participating in the law of sin and death, then you yourself are going to curse yourself. And then you're going to turn, oh, look at the devil. Look what the devil did in my life. Look what he did in my life. The devil's just doing this in my life. No, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's not true. That is not true. You're quiet on me. I, I need to go over this side. <laughs> Amen. No, no. He can't, he can't do that. Oh, yeah, he can. He did it to me. You willingly participated. You did it to yourself. It's a law. It's a law of sin and death. It's a law of sin and death. Amen? Well, if that's true, the other side is true. If I can intentionally and willfully begin to do what? Live by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. My life is going to elevate from this moment forward. We're going to go somewhere with God. My life is not going to look like my past. All the hell I've been through, all the pain I've been through, I realize I did it to myself. If you don't take personal responsibility with where you are, you're going to repeat it over and over again. Amen. You become a victim and you blame everybody else, including the devil. Look what the devil has done. Look what the devil. I'm telling you, it just is not that way. It's just not that way. Hey, hallelujah. But if you intentionally will live by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, there's only one thing that's going to happen in your life. The peace of God, the power of God, the anointing of God is going to begin to function in your life. Glory to God. And all of the, all of the bad is going to die. All the bad is going to not just go away, it's going to die. 
I said it's going to die. Uh, every addiction that's drug you down over and over again, it's going to die. It's going to fall off of you. Hallelujah. And you're going to come out of that victorious. Victorious. Hallelujah. 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 You're going to come out of that with a new addiction. Hallelujah. You're going to be addicted to the anointing. You're going to be addicted to the Holy Ghost. You're going to be addicted to the presence of God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. This whole, this whole Romans thing, head, you know, it just heads up right here in Romans chapter 8 and tells us that, that there is a law, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that makes, makes me free. It doesn't, it doesn't say it sets you free. It makes me free. It makes me free. He made me free. Hallelujah. He made me this way. He made me this way. He made me free. He made me healed. Hallelujah. He made me blessed. Praise the Lord. He made me that way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to give you just in one small sentence, what is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus? What is that? Okay, number one, Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Number two, after his resurrection, he sent the Holy Spirit. God, through his grace, makes you 100% righteous. He makes you 100% righteous by His grace. Amen. The scripture there says, He fulfills the righteousness of the law inside of you. And it becomes as if you have never sinned. That, that's a fact. That is the effect of the applied blood of Jesus. You become as if you have never sinned. Hallelujah. Then the Holy Ghost comes to live inside of you. Right? So you are the, the righteousness of God. The Holy Ghost lives inside of you. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead comes to live inside of you. Hallelujah. I say it like this. He didn't just save you and pass through you. He came into you and he still is in there. He's in there. Hallelujah. So the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, resides, resides, abides, remains. I am a temple. You are a temple of the Holy Ghost. The temple of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Say amen. Amen. Now, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. All that being true, are you with me? Hallelujah. All that being true, all of that power is released or directed by your thoughts. That's it. Amen. I'm going to say that again. You got all that power in you. But that power is released. That power is used by your thoughts. He said, be carnally minded, be spiritually minded, mindedness, your thoughts, your established ways of thinking, your established ways of thinking. Hallelujah. So if I understand that, then I can now begin to what? Cooperate with the power in me and begin to think thoughts that are in line with the power that's inside of me. And when I do that, I begin to release that power. I begin to see evidence of that power. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I stop working against myself. And I start thinking in line with the power that's in me. I give, I give a place for that power to flow out of. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, I've got, I've got three pictures here I want to show. Are those pictures? Yeah. I've got three pictures. These, these look weird to you at first, but I want to explain them and then I'm going to close. All right. This is an illustration. Right? So that right there, that right there is a what? Is a dot. I took an ink pen and made a dot. Okay, that's what that is. Right? That's a dot. Now that, okay, I'm going to show you three pictures, then I'm going to go back and explain them. Are you with me? Okay, that's a dot. Go to the next one. 
That's a line. Go to the next one. That's a retrace line. I went back and forth over it several times. You see, I even, I even got out of that track, but then I got to try and go back in. Are you with me? Okay. Now, that dot, go back to the dot. The dot symbolizes a single thought. All right? Now, having a single thought is not, is not your problem. Having a single thought is not going to solve your problem. But if your problem is going to be solved, it's going to, it's going to, be, it's going to, it's going to be because of your thoughts. Somebody say, oh, you pastor, you believe in the power of positive thinking. I believe what the Bible says. That the power in me through redemption and the abiding presence of the Holy Ghost is now released by my authority, by my thoughts. And then my thought, then my, what I say is an expression of my th- what I'm thinking. Okay? I got one thought. That's all I have right there is one thought. Okay? Are you with me? All right, now go to the next picture. Now that line represents a way of thinking. It's a way of thinking. Okay? Now what happens when I get a way of thinking is as I begin to live, I begin to retrace that over and over again. Go, go to the next one. And that becomes an established way of thinking. An established way of thinking. Now here's the problem. That line, horizontal, right, is blocking what's coming out of here. All this power that's shut up inside of me can't get out of me. Right? It can't get out of me because it's blocked by a way of thinking. It's blocked by a way of thinking. Now, Jim Hockaday said, and I'm going to quote him, he said, the amazing thing about it is, we have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead living in us, and by our own will, we, we, bring, it to, we bring it to zero. The power of the human will, that God so honors the human will, that by decision, by decision, that power is, is as if it doesn't exist. Because there's a way of thinking, there's a way of thinking that you think that way, you think that way, you think that way, you think that way, and you pray and you pray, but you still think that way. And you pray and you pray, and you still think that way. You have the whole church to pray and to pray, but you still think that way. And the power is wanting to come up. The power is wanting to flow out. But you keep blocking it. You keep blocking it with your thinking. Your thinking is blocking the the power. The power cannot flow out because of what? Because of a way of thinking. Because of a way of thinking. Yeah, exactly. A way of thinking. But what would happen, what would happen if through the Word and the Holy Spirit, you would say, okay, we're going to do away with that, and I'm I'm going to get a way of thinking that runs like this. I'm going to get a way of thinking that runs like this. Hallelujah. That my way of thinking directly connects me to the spirit that lives inside of me. And what I begin to establish, what I begin to establish is a channel, a channel for release. A channel for release. Hallelujah. You see, Jesus said, Jesus said, out of your belly flows rivers of living water. How does water flow? How does water flow? I promise you that if I poured water on this cement floor, that water is going to find the lowest spot to find, and, and just kind of make its way through the floor. Right? Isn't that right? So water is going to find, find a way to flow somewhere. And if it's totally flat, it's just going to lay there. Amen? Amen. I know in my yard, if it rains a lot, the, the water's going to run off the hill, and there's a certain spot. I can tell you exactly where it goes. I know exactly where it goes. It, it, the water over time has created a, uh, created a place, right? Amen? Hallelujah. See, that whole thing has worked against us. But God wants you to know, God wants you to know that you can turn the whole thing around. You can turn the whole thing around. Hallelujah. That's what, that's what meditation does. Meditation begins to establish a new way of thinking. A new way of thinking. Hallelujah. A new way of thinking. Praise the Lord. 
Yeah, a new way of thinking. A new way of thinking. A new way of thinking. Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, until you, until you do that in the correct way, you're always going to have a block. And they don't mean you're not a good person. Doesn't mean when you die, you're not going to heaven. It just means you're not experiencing the power of God in this life to break you through and do in your life every, everything you really want and need Him to do. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. But you can, you can take God's Word. You can take God's Word, meditation, your imagination, and I'm going to say a couple of words here, and some of you, don't get mad at me. Amen. Meditation, imagination, and visualization. Some of you say, oh, I don't believe in that. That's, that's new age. New age doesn't believe in the blood of Jesus. Get real. Come on. Amen. Don't believe in the blood of Jesus. Hey, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so you began to take a scripture, you take a scripture, by stripes you were healed, right? You take a scripture, and you begin to meditate on that scripture, but then what do you do? You use your imagination, you use your imagination, which is the function of your mind, to be spiritually minded, amen? Imagination is a function of your mind. So you take that scripture, by stripes you were healed, and you begin to imagine what it looks like to be healed. You begin to imagine what it feels like to be healed. You begin to imagine going to the doctor and the doctor saying to you, go home, you've been cured, something has changed. You begin to imagine that. You see that in your mind. You see that in your imagination. Hallelujah. And with your imagination, you have the ability to envision. You have the ability, you have the ability to, to see it. But it's not just a fantasy. Hey, say, how come it's not a fantasy? No, it's based in the Bible. And you got the Holy Ghost living inside of you, make it come to pass. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you take a scripture, you take a scripture, and just don't memorize the, the text on a white page. But you let the scripture paint a picture in your mind. And then you practice seeing that in your head visualizing it, imagining it, experiencing it ahead of time. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now I'm closing. The first time God dealt with me about this very subject was, it's been, it's been, it's been 20 years ago. And you've heard, many of you have heard this testimony, but I'm going to tell it again because it's one of the best ways for me to illustrate what I'm talking about. In, in 2000, the end of 2003, there was a tsunami that hit, that hit, hit uh, South, South Asia. Many of you know about that. P many thousands of people died. Okay. Pastor Conrad, who was here, when was he? He was here in March and preached. Pastor Conrad was pastoring, he's still pastoring, in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka was impacted by that tsunami. Okay. In the month of December is when that tsunami happened. And then it's January. And I'm praying to the Lord, Lord, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Well, at the time, I'm not a pastor. I'm an itinerant minister. And I'm dependent upon, you know, churches inviting me in order to preach and receive an offering or whatever. And those December, January are very not good months. Right? usually for traveling ministers. But, and I said to the Lord, I said, Holy Spirit, teach me. Show me what to do. Show me what to do. And the Holy Spirit said, that showed me that. I saw, it in a, I saw it in a flash. Right? I saw it in a flash. The Holy Spirit said to me, take a $100 bill. Well, I didn't even have a $100 bill. So I got on the internet and I printed one out. I, I didn't counterfeit. Okay. But I, print, I printed it out. So many of you have heard this story, but I'm going to tell it again. Okay, so I took the $100 bill, took that $100 bill, and I looked at it. I looked at it. I'm talking about me spiritually minded. You set your mind, using your mind. Okay? 
I looked at that $100 bill until I could close my eyes and still see the $100 bill. Now I've got a $100 bill in my mind. I looked at it until I could see it in my head. I could see it. See, the power in me is dependent upon my thinking. So I, I had it in my mind, this $100 bill in my mind. And so I took that $100 bill and I counted to 10000 The Holy Spirit said to me, take $10,000 to Sri Lanka, give it to Pastor Conrad to, to, to help a community that was impacted by the, by the tsunami. Well, I didn't have, have 10000 not even near 10000 and I had no way to get it. So what, what I did was, is, is, I, is I meditated on counting to 10,000 with $100 bills in my head. And I didn't, have, I didn't have the money. I did not have the money. Believe me, I didn't have the money. Right? So I have this $100 bill, and I count, I count to 1,000, and I see it in one stack. Then I count to 1,000, then I count to 1,000, and I would, I would count them in stacks to 10,000. I did that in my head. I did that two times a day, sometimes three times a day. I'd count to 10,000 with these $100 bills in my head. I'd do it three times a day. Two weeks into the process, I get a phone call. Listen, I'm not, I'm not calling people, hey, can you help me out? Got some money, give me some money. I, I, I don't do that. I, and I, I wouldn't do it and I didn't do it. But I'm counting money, I'm counting money, I'm counting money. Two weeks into the process, I get a phone call from a pastor. I knew him, but I did, I, he had never been to my house. He said to me, he said, kind of come to your house. I said, yeah, come. So he came to my house, came in the house, sat down, and he said to me, he says, the Lord told me to tell you something. I said, okay. And he doesn't know any of this going on. This is all just me and Jesus. He looked at me and said, the Lord wants me to tell you that what you're doing is working. What you're praying for is coming. And he told me to give you this. And he pulls out $100 bill and he handed it to me. He, had, he told me to give you this. Now for me it was significant. It wasn't 520s. It was in exactly the first $100 bill that I had. He handed it to me. And the moment he handed me that $100 bill, from that moment forward, it was like the dam broke. And money started coming from everywhere. Money in, in the next two weeks, the next two weeks while I was walking down the sidewalk to get in my car and go to the RDU airport, I had $12,000 in cash in my hand. $12,000 in cash in my hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. It's the, your mind. It's a function of your mind that releases the power that's inside of you. It's a function of your mind. Read Romans 8. It's a function of your mind that releases the power that's inside of you. And you can learn to do that. You can learn how to do that. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody stand up with me. Glory to God. You are good people. Amen. Hallelujah. If we're going to be spirit led, we can't always get out at 12. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Come on, let's lift up our hands to Jesus. Lord, I give you praise. I lift up my hands to you. Holy Spirit, you are the spirit of wisdom and revelation. You're our teacher, our guide into truth. Holy Spirit, we receive you. We receive your guidance. We receive your revelation. We receive your enlightenment, your revelation of your word. We receive it, not only to hear it, but to be doers of it. To be doers of it, Lord. And God began to, based on your word, began to see a new picture and begin to establish new ways of thinking. To have a vision using our own imagination, our own function of our own mind and seeing a different outcome. Seeing a different outcome. Father, I thank, thank you for that, Lord. God, I praise you for that in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, 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 in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 
You say, Pastor, how does that apply to me? Well, it depends on your, your need. It depends on your need. You've got that, that, that need in your life, that crisis in your life. Well, you sit down in a quiet place and you get some scripture together that, that give you promise that, that God will fulfill that need. Then once you have scripture that promise the fulfillment of that need, that you sit there quietly and you use your imagination and you see yourself. You enjoy the picture like a movie. You enjoy it coming to pass. You enjoy the fulfillment of it. You hear the people say. You hear the doctors say. You hear them say in your imagination. And you meditate on that point. And while you're doing that, there's something that's flowing. There's something that's flowing. You are applying the law of the spirit of life. The law of the spirit of life. Hallelujah. Amen. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Hallelujah. You're here today and you need, you need a breakthrough in your life. Maybe it's spiritual, maybe it's physical, or some other area of need in your life. You need a breakthrough in your life. I want you to raise up your hand right now. Pastor, that's me. I need a breakthrough in my life. Yeah, there's hands that are raised. I need a breakthrough in my life. Amen. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, you, 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 maybe you knew the Lord, walked with the Lord, but, you're, but you've gone back from following Him. You're not, you, want, you need to recommit your life to Christ. Then, then I want to for sure pray for you today. Lift up your hand if that's you. Pastor, I need to recommit my life to Christ. Yeah, there's a hand. Someone else, yeah. Their hands raised. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Those of you that raise your hand, man, I'm, I'm going to ask men, ladies, brothers, sisters, I'm going to ask you to come forward. Just come forward. Our prayer team is going to join me here. We're going to believe with you. We're going to pray for you. Hallelujah. And I believe that the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is going to touch you today. The Spirit of the Lord is going to minister to you today. Hallelujah. He's going to minister to you today. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He's going to minister to you today. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Hallelujah. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody in, the, everybody in the congregation, lift up your hands. We're just going to pray over everybody first together, unified. Father, we just stretch our hands over every person that's come this, forward this morning. And God, I thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost that's already working on them, in them, and through them. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that today marks the change. Today marks a new place. Today marks a new direction. God marks a new, 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 a new thing in, your, in their life, God. A new thing in their life, God. Hallelujah. A new, a new day in their life. A new era. Yeah, that's what the Lord said. The Lord says, if you, as you apply this, today marks the beginning of a new era. Of a new season. Of a new time in your life. Hallelujah. 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 A new era. A new era. Praise God. Glory, glory, glory. Thank you, Father. That's right. That's right. That's right. I'm going to invite my team to come. Come and help me. Help me pray. Help me pray. Hallelujah. Raise up your hands. That's right. Let the Holy Ghost touch you. Let the Holy Ghost touch you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Lord, I just...
Oh,